I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. During this episode of Dementia Matters, we are going to revisit a topic we've discussed a few times over the last three years, and that is exercise. A growing body of research is showing just how important exercise can be in improving and maintaining brain health, and even lowering the risk for developing dementia. The ultimate goal of this research is to determine if exercise can slow or prevent Alzheimer's disease-related changes in the brains of people at higher risk for Alzheimer's disease. If the scientific community can show that, then one day doctors and other providers can prescribe exercise the way they prescribe a medication or physical therapy. And that is exciting because as we learn more about the complexities of Alzheimer's disease, the more it becomes evident that a traditional cure for this disease might not be possible, but the road to ending Alzheimer's disease lies in prevention. So to talk about an exciting recent study from researchers in the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center that is taking us one step further in this path to a prescription for Alzheimer's disease, we have invited Max Gatton back to Dementia Matters. Max is an exercise physiologist and research specialist who works in Dr. Ozioma Okonkwo's lab on a number of exercise-related studies. Max, welcome back to Dementia Matters. Thanks, Dr. Chen. It's really nice to be speaking with you again. Now, I want to talk about the recently published results from the Protocol of Aerobic Exercise and Cognitive Health Study, or in short, the REACH study. Now, this was a pilot study, which for our listeners, we could describe as a startup study or even a fact-finding study. And pilot studies typically include a limited number of people, and scientists often use them to test their research methodology before launching a larger study that might include hundreds or even thousands of research participants. So Max, what were you trying to learn with the REACH study? Well, um, we're really looking to identify factors um, that can be modified before a person um, starts having symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so that we can hopefully prevent them or at least delay uh, the progression of disease. And so with this study, we were looking to recruit people who had risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, such as family history or genetic risk, um, and then implement an exercise program in them uh, before any symptoms of cognitive change to determine whether uh, the exercise could actually uh, diminish markers for Alzheimer's disease in these people. And so did you have a hard time recruiting people? Uh, Well, actually, we're really lucky here at the uh, Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Center to have uh, a pool of participants who who are enriched for family history of uh, the disease and genetic risk, too. And so we did have uh, kind of a ready pool of participants to recruit from. Max, how many people were involved in this pilot study? We had 23 people uh, in reach. And it sounds like everyone stayed in the study throughout this this 26-week period? Just about. We did have one person who unfortunately had to discontinue uh, the exercise because of a, an unplanned surgery. Um, but aside from that, we did have everyone stick with us, uh, which is a real testament to their dedication. Yeah, the dedication is quite incredible considering they were in, they had to come in for a lot of different training sessions and they had to do a lot of paperwork to sort of give you the data that you needed. Well, no, absolutely. It's it's three times a week for 6 months. I mean, that's a huge lifestyle change. And I'm wondering if you learned anything else from your participants besides the data that you were collecting. Did they share stories with you and you found common themes? Were there other benefits? that you guys were just not studying. Absolutely. And I see this in um, basically every exercise trial that I've been a part of where, you know, of course the physiology is changing and, um, you know, we're studying the the direct outcomes of the study, but anecdotally um, people are happier. Um, you know, they kind of have, uh, it's like putting on a fresh pair of glasses I've heard um, with the, the lifestyle change and having 
um, you know, interaction with a personal trainer, um, really good effects on mental health, I'd say. And in your study, did you see any sort of issues of retention or people burning out during the study? No, actually, um, our participants were incredibly adherent to the the program, um, which is a real testament to their dedication. Um, so that was really nice to see that uh, over 99% of the sessions that we prescribed were completed. Um, and so that gives us a lot of confidence in the results uh, of the study, too, when we're going to analyze what changed in their brains, uh, because we know that they were actually completing the exercise that we prescribed, um, basically taking their exercise medicine. That's fantastic. And so what did you find in this study? Uh, well, the initial results are, are really exciting. Um, to start with, I mean, we found that their cardiorespiratory fitness uh, improved. And so that's kind of an expected finding and confirms that they were exercising at the intensity and the, the level that we were looking for. Uh, but beyond that, in terms of brain change, uh, we found that their executive function improved compared to the group um, that was kind of maintaining their usual level of uh, sedentary activity. Um, and executive function is a really important um, uh, marker for Alzheimer's disease because we know that it changes with the disease um, and it's directed at uh, kind of goal attainment and planning um, day-to-day activities. And that, you know, of course, um, declines with, uh, with Alzheimer's disease. We also found um, that their glucose metabolism within a, a sector of their brain um, actually improved over the course of this 20 week, 26 week study. And that's a really promising finding too, because the area in which it improved um, is an early marker, uh, or excuse me, an early uh, area in which uh, glucose metabolism declines with Alzheimer's disease. And that last point, I think, is really important. And so when you see improved metabolism in areas that are often found in people with Alzheimer's disease or the early part, you know, what does that mean for, for a participant when they hear, oh, this part of my brain has improved glucose use? You know, what do you say to them? Yeah. Well, it basically means that their brain is able to use blood sugar to power cognition better. And we think that that's important because it declines early on in the disease. And so if we can kind of stave that off, then perhaps we're getting at uh, the point that we were mentioning at the beginning of the, our chat uh, about kind of delaying the progression of, of Alzheimer's disease. And is it fair to say that with improved um, memory scores or testing scores and this improved brain glucose metabolism, that in essence, the brain cells may just be healthier, that the exercise is improving the health of the brain? Yeah, certainly. I mean, this is um, not a direct marker, but it's kind of a surrogate for the physiology of the brain cells. And it looks like the physiology is healthier, certainly. So this seems like a pretty incredible finding. And so I'm wondering then, well, what's next now that you have this data and these conclusions? Yeah, this is a really rich study, um, given that it was uh, so long and we had so many outcomes from it. Um, so, you know, we've, uh, we've been planning kind of the next analyses. And, and the next step for us is to look into the metabolomic effects um, of, of the exercise program. And by metabolomics, I mean kind of the molecular changes within the cellular processes um, of what's going on in the body. And these can be really important for understanding how exercise actually impacts um, brain physiology and body physiology so that we can understand with um, maybe greater clarity how to prescribe exercise as a medicine. So what kinds of things will you look at when you say me metabolics or metabolomics? What was the word that you use? Yeah, metabolomics. Metabolomics. Mm -hmm. So what are you looking at specifically? We're looking at the molecules within, uh, within the body uh, circulation, basically in the blood, um, that are changing uh, as a result of, of the exercise program. So some of these m molecules could be antioxidants. Some of them might support, say, vascular health. Um, others support the nervous system. Uh, and that's just kind of scratching the surface. There are literally thousands of these molecules, but it's a kind of a snapshot of the cellular physiology of what's going on inside the body. And I think a lot of us can attest to that, especially during the difficult period in which we're in, that we our moods are better, that our stress level seems to be better controlled. You know, I wonder with your usual physical activity group, which, you know, what did you define as usual physical activity? And did you find anything significant in that group too? 
Sure. Well, the usual physical activity group is a really important one because it's kind of our baseline for comparison to the exercising group. And by usual physical activity, we mean that they continue um, their day-to-day -day habits uh, that they did before the study began. Um, and so we ask that they continue doing less than 150 minutes a week of exercise, um, which is what they came in at. Um, and that's an important comparison group because uh, without it, we can't know whether it's actually the program that we're prescribing or whether it's something about coming into our center for testing that improves uh, the cognition and things that we are evaluating with the study. And why did you choose 150 minutes per week and a target heart rate of 70 to 80 percent of your heart rate reserve? Mm -hmm. We're kind of at the forefront of understanding the effects of exercise on the brain. And the national guidelines um, for Americans are, are to do at least 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity activity. And so the, the intensity there that we chose, the 70 to 80 percent of heart rate reserve, is a, a vigorous, maybe uh, vigorously moderate <laughs> uh, level of exercise. And, and so we were really targeting the, the national guidelines, but maybe in the future we'll be able to test uh, different frequencies or different intensities or even different paradigms of, say, interval training and the effects on cognition. You know, what do you think is better? Someone who is engaging in exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week to get to that 150 or 100 or 50 minutes a day, three days a week to get to that 150? Oh, good question. I mean, between those two, to be completely honest, both are um, kind of equivalent in my mind. Um, but I'll kind of put an asterisk on that by saying that we don't actually know how long the effects of exercise last for the specific brain outcomes that we're looking at. We know that in other diseases, it's really needed to do exercise every 48 hours or so, because that's kind of how long the physiological effects last. But it could be that um, for brain purposes, um, the effects last, say, 24 hours or 72 hours or maybe even a week out. Um, but for now, we know that doing at least three sessions a week um, does seem to improve uh, these Alzheimer's disease outcomes that we were looking at. And so that's helpful to know. So at least three times a week is important. But you know, in clinic, I tell people, if you can do more, that's great. More is better in this regard. Um, I'm wondering, are there studies looking at this new trend of high intensity interval training? And where do you see that fitting into the sort of research program that you're a part of? That's definitely the next steps. Um, we need to understand how intensity plays into uh, the, the brain effects of exercise. And there are several trials going on that I'm aware of um, across the, the country and the world. Um, looking at different paradigms like that with high intensity interval training. Um, we, I think, need to kind of, you know, jump on that train um, with other studies that we're planning and, uh, and certainly we'll be involved in those investigations. Wonderful. And for those of our listeners that are feeling overwhelmed or intimidated by some of the things that Max Gitan talked about, it is important to know that there are still benefits from daily walking. And I think Max would speak to the fact that any sort of movement is good movement. And a person can get their heart rate up, maybe not as high as 70 to 80 percent as, as Max was looking at. But, you know, it's relative to your body. Would you agree with that, Max? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I tell my parents, uh, in fact, to, you know, get out for a walk. And, and like you said, it is relative. Um, for an Olympic marathoner, a walk probably won't do you so much good. Um, but for folks like you and me, it's certainly going to be a, a beneficial effect from, from walking. Well, that all seems incredible and, and something that hopefully you'll be able to interpret and provide um, good conclusions for the rest of us who are waiting to hear this. Uh, and so I do hope that you come back on our podcast once you have more of this data and, and more to share with us. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'll look forward to sharing it, uh, I hope, in the near future. All right. Well, thank you, Max Gaetan. And uh, this is Dementia Matters. Thanks a lot, Dr. Chen. Please subscribe to Dementia Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center 
combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.